Good afternoon, everybody. Whoa! <laughs> we made it! We succeeded to make the move from Hamburg to Leipzig. Congratulations to you all! It's weird, I got, uh, last year actually was the year that I finally found my way in the labyrinth in Hamburg. <laughs> and then we decided to move, we, uh, and we have a new labyrinth. It's growing and growing, and I suppose next year we have even more stuff to discover. So I'm looking forward to next year. But for now, for all data junks among us, here are the figures, the facts, the results. We can start to measure and focus on next year. Leon, it's yours. Thank you. So let's start with a knock review. Um, this is Marcus. My name is Leon. And together with a whole lot of other people, we run this year's event network. And let's, let's dive just in. Yeah. So. As you've been aware, with the move to Leipzig, we were entering a whole new area for Congress. Everything, obviously, is quite large now. Everything is bigger now. And just to give you an idea, here's the size of the CCH. And next to it, there's the size of uh, Messe Leipzig. So in this presentation, we would like to give you an insight on the new challenges which came with the growth and size, like acquiring bandwidth, redesigning our backbone, rolling out access and Wi-Fi on a much larger area than we've ever done before, and uh, all that while adhering to, to new health and safety regulations. So given the sheer size of the venue, we needed to radically scale up our network and put our top priority on upscaling safety. So we started in summer with a summer trip to Messe Leipzig and learned all about the existing infrastructure. We were excited to discover that this venue's impressive fiber network actually includes only single mode cabling, which is our favorite, favorite type of fiber. So as you can see, there was also plenty of free fibers available for us to use, but at the same time, we were overwhelmed by the amount of cabling. So we needed to find a way to reduce all the information down to a usable and understandable format we could work with. So obviously, the only sensible choice was to turn to future technology and engrave a digestible cabling diagram onto a plate of lasagna. Having feasted on all this information, we were able to see a clearer picture of the network we are going to build for 15,000 participants of the new era of Congress. So finally, we were making new progress with our planning. But we weren't just finished yet. Health and safety regulations are very strict in venues like this. So lots of thought has to go into fire prevention, emergency escape planning, and other security and safety-related stuff. Just like all the other teams, we were also busy ensuring everyone's safety. And yeah, we need to do our part as well, basically. So obviously, on the network side, this means make sure your data packets have a wide enough escape route towards the internet. So we've actually built a fully redundant 100 gigabit backbone over three in-house routers. Furthermore, while we were busy working on the, the on-site network layout, we asked our procurement manager to work on arranging some uplink connectivity. And as an expert in his field, we figured he would be well aware of what kind, kind of connectivity was needed. Um, as you know, 
We've seen peak uplink usages in the ballpark of 30 to 40 gigabits per second in the past. So the logical thing to do would be to arrange 50 or maybe 60 or even 100 gigabits um, just to be on the safe side. Unfortunately, though, <laughs> While he was dutifully arranging uplinks, we lost track of him and forgot to tell him to stop. <laughs> so next thing we knew, he had accidentally arranged 400 gigabits of uplink capacity, leaving this building in three geographically redundant directions. <laughs> so this was possible due to some very friendly providers, um, some of which even loaned us their lab equipment so we could field test bleeding edge technology um, with futuristic names such as alien wavelength, allow, allowing us to run 200 gigabit per second over one single wavelength to Watt Berlin. And yeah, so that's how that ended. <laughs> so after learning about this, we decided to roll with, roll with it because after all, who are we to say no to more bandwidth, right? <laughs> However, this gave us additional challenges for acquiring the necessary network hardware, obviously. In the past, we were always worrying that Juniper, one of our main sponsors for the network equipment, might not have the necessary amount of the required big routers available for us. So this year, knowing all the facts, we were going to them early, talked to them early, and uh, told them what we actually needed, the big routers where we connect 100 gigs, stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, we learned then very last minute that uh, the routers we wanted were not available. The only routers they could give us were three times bigger than the one we were asking for. <laughs> As a streamlined organization, we were running this obviously through our procurement manager, who enthousi enthusiastically agreed with the proposal because this solves another of our problems. I mean, you know, in Hamburg, we were talking about it for quite some time already in the last years. Well, we could only collocate our routers in like fun-sized saunas. The patch rooms here, in the contrary, are very big, well air-conditioned. And uh, with the small routers we would have in Hamburg, we would fearing that we would, might be running in danger of losing, losing them in the spacious rooms here in Messe Leipzig. So the bigger routers were also serving a double purpose. We are not leaving them here or by accident because we're thinking, oh, there's nothing in there anymore. <laughs> so for additional safety, uh, we introduced a triangle router topology. So your data can still escape in case any one path is blocked by a firewall angel. This means that your data is now around about 150% more secure and safe than ever. So upscaling was a central theme for everyone at this year's Congress, uh, also for Wi-Fi, obviously. Um, as you know, in the CCH, there was no more room for adding more access points, which is maybe why we had to leave. Um, but luckily, here in Leipzig, we were able to grow our potential and cover more space with Wi-Fi access than ever. We, we brought 180 access points uh, to Leipzig, which is the, the lower bar, and that's about the number we uh, brought to Hamburg. Um, but luckily, you helped us out by running a lot of rogue access points, <laughs> and that's the upper bar. So, <laughs> so thanks for that. Um, Unfortunately, thereby you ruined everyone's Wi-Fi experience on, on, the, on the congested band. Um, well. Yeah, the problem here is that actually SSID spamming is taking away a lot of airtime for everyone in your environment. There are people uh, spawning up, up to uh, 100, 200 different SSIDs, thus really ruining the Wi-Fi for everyone in their whole neighborhood. We saw things like this which on paper is funny, <laughs> but if you're sitting there in your assembly area and you don't get any Wi-Fi anymore, you don't have your Wi-Fi signal, but you don't get any packets through, this is the reason why. People are starting to spam, starting to spin up their own access points, taking away frequencies which we could really, really use for our access points. 
So basically, whoever did this and all the other access points out there were the reason that the Wi-Fi reception wasn't as good as it was in Hamburg. So the problem is that when you open an access point, uh, it, it has to broadcast its SSID in beacons that are transmitted at the lowest possible frame rate. So it, they take up a lot of airtime, even when there's no data transmitted over them. So please don't bring your own access points in the future. So. <clears throat> Speaking of trolling, at one point we were looking at our traffic graphs and noticed some odd patterns that we couldn't really explain. We thought maybe it's uh, the streaming traffic from, from the lecture halls, but then we figured it doesn't correlate with the lecture schedule. And then we were wondering what would cause five gigabits of outgoing IPv6 traffic in such strange patterns. But then it occurred to us Someone was sending us a message. <laughs> so when decoded as Morse code, the traffic patterns actually read 34C3. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we started a new tradition last year, which was quite popular and very accurate, to summarize for members of our, of our press necessary information. We have put everything basically on one slide, so you just have to take a picture of this, and then you can write all your articles you want. You have the right information, you don't need to misquote anyone or just invent some stuff. So. Uh, just to uh, go through it real quick, we had a total uplink capacity of uh, 400 gigabits per second, leaving Messe Leipzig. We were telling you about this already. We had IP capacity here within Messe Leipzig and in Berlin of up to 320 gigabits per second by uh, diverse pro uh, internet providers who were sponsoring us. Uh, of all this uh, bandwidth we are providing here, you were using up to 42.2 gigabits per second which can be better. <laughs> we had a little bit of space left, so you know, next time, leave your access points at home, bring some servers, bring some stuff that actually can use the traffic, and then everything will be fine. Lee, get a mic if you have one, or is there someone on the internet available uh, with we, a question? We're, we're not no. quite ready yet. We have one more thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Actually, actually, two more things. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, we have some uh, peak Wi-Fi users of over 7,600. We had uh, almost eight, 180 access points deployed, and yeah, all this wouldn't have been possible without our sponsors, of course. Thanks for providing, helping us. So, <clears throat> one more. So after, after, after our sponsors had delivered us 15 pallets of equipment, um, with the great help of Knock Help Desk, an amazing amount of motivated and dedicated angels to help us with all the things who we'd like to thank. Um, <laughs> everything worked out fine in the end. And we were able to actually give you the networking experience you deserve. But during the planning phase, we encountered one more enormous problem. Yeah, just like in the last years, we wanted to apply our normal recipe for building this uh, CCC network, obviously. But suddenly we ran into all kinds of issues we couldn't really explain. Something just seemed to be off, and we couldn't put our finger on the problem. But then it occurred to us, our vision was still the same as last year. So obviously, that was the main problem. We upscaled then and secured every last, uh, we upscaled and secured every last bit of the network, obviously, but we forgot to do the same with our vision. So we hurried uh, to an emergency weekend retreat and soul searching mission to come up with a way to cope with this gross ne neglect. And then we finally were successful. So let me present to you our new futuristic, <laughs> upscaled, 100% safe vision. <laughs> no.
now finally the universe was in harmony again, and so we can peacefully rest and go to the long-anticipated questions. Hey, thank you. <laughs> there are questions. There is one on the internet to start from. Yes. Which autonomous system did we interact with the most? Sorry, can you repeat? Which autonomous system did we, as oh. the corners, interact the do, most? Do you have that number? I think it was Hetzner, but I don't really yeah, know. Oh yeah, it, it was probably Hetzner, for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> Here, microphone number one. If I wanted to leave you a message in Morse code by sending large amount of traffic, where would I think all that traffic to? So my advice would be um, to send it anywhere, but with a really low time to live, so that the packets get dropped soon after the router, and it doesn't annoy anyone, but it will show up in our graphs. <laughs> and I hope this is what they did this year. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone number six. Uh, is there any extended uh, metrics or data dumps if somebody wants to dive into like the graphing and data that you'll make available? Hmm. I think we could publish some of them, yeah. Because uh, we, we have them in our Prometheus database, and then we obviously need, need to check which are sensitive and which aren't. But uh, we could work on, yeah, maybe, for example, the uplink graph, if you want to analyze that in more detail, we could upload that somewhere. Just follow our Twitter account. In case we do, you'll notice it there. Microphone number one. So not really a question, but uh, I couldn't saturate the 10 gigabit uh, link I had uh, a server in the Yolo Colo connected to. Was it you? <laughs> <laughs> Was it you? <laughs> well, I had the server, and it had uh, around 3 gigabits of traffic most of the time coming to. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, well, question. Colo was collect, uh, connected with 100 gig to the backbone. The backbone had 100 gig, and we had 400 gig outgoing capacity. So, in theory, capacity was there. Right, question out of space. Will there be a presentation about the alien wave and the test? Um, so, the sponsors uh, who did that test with us, uh, they have pre prepared a presentation, I think, uh, they are planning to publish that, and we might even publish it, and that will contain a lot more facts. Um, so yeah, I suggest follow our Twitter account, and then we can uh, upload this presentation. Number four, or two, what is it? Two. <laughs> so the question is about the local network. Uh, what tools are you using for automated switch configuration? <laughs> We have, uh, well, for the configuration itself, we didn't have any tools at all. We had tools for generation of the configuration. So basically, the, the configuration would be applied manually, but uh, the configuration itself would come from self-written uh, Python tools, which would generate the necessary configuration from our IPAM. Thanks. Great. Here, sir, please. Is there a map of all the access points? Yes. Can you upload it? <laughs> can you upload it? We can probably make some screenshots. I'll talk to the Wi-Fi guys who have it in their controller and see if... I'm not sure it shouldn't contain any sensitive information, but, but yeah, we can, we can look at that. Thanks. I follow you on Twitter anyway. <laughs> Number seven. So you allowed arbitrary usernames and passwords in the encrypted Wi-Fi. Did you examine those? And if so, was there anything particularly entertaining? <laughs> Well, we didn't have any statistics this year because it was basically the same. I mean... Yeah, we've done so in the past. You yeah. can look it up in, in our previous presentations. I, I think it'll be similar. We stopped looking at them because it was funny in the first years. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's basically the same. There's random stuff, then there's a lot of 34C3 and people cursing. <laughs> Question from the web. How many turbines did we upload and download? Hmm. Have we collected this number this year? Uh, a lot. A lot, <laughs> yeah. A lot. <laughs> so, when we, so when we publish uh, the raw data for uplink graph, someone can integrate that and yeah. figure it out. <laughs> That's much I think what? we should, yeah, we, we, we maybe have time for one more question, but then we should There's hand it over to other the teams. And then we, yeah. So regarding the graphs, will you publish a history of graphs 
year-wise, on many previous years? Yeah, we haven't really bothered with saving all of that, and each year uh, it bites us because we, <laughs> we need to do the planning on how much capacity do we, do we need where. Uh, so what we have is the presentations, and we always look up the number of, well, the, the, peak, the peak values. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons we have this fact slide in there, to help us with next year's planning. <laughs> Great, guys. Thank you. Give a warm, warm applause. Really. We made it. Thanks. Thank you. Now we take the other Liam. <laughs> A bit more exotic network, and we had complete different challenges. But this year, we have UMTS 3G. <laughs> and yeah, the whole mobile network is run with free and open source software, Osmocom. But there was a bit of a difference between because last year and the year before, it was running quite smooth and stable. We, were, uh, we had a bit of experience. And the network was a bit simpler. So this was how our network and how our setup looked like. But with 3G, Osmocom decided and had to a bit extend the, the infrastructure. And now it looks like this. <laughs> and it was quite new for everyone. So even for the Osmocom people, we only used it for a small network with one base station and one phone connected to it. Now we have lots of base stations and even more people connected to it. So it took a lot of time to, to run off this. And each of the bubbles is really one daemon with one separate configuration file and they all have to match else it doesn't work. But even if it looks that complicated, it doesn't require a lot of power. We run everything on a small APU except the voice transcoding, which was running on a bigger server. But yeah, the whole GFSM and UMTS network was on the, this small box. We had to add some small sort of USB dongle because we couldn't log enough of the core dumps because the things were crashing. So this is the central part, the main infrastructure, and then you need all the base stations. And this is how they look like. They are quite small. We have Generally, at every location, we have one of the small base stations, the GSM, the black ones, and then a UMTS, the white one. We have them at several locations. We also didn't require, I'll explain more later why, we also didn't require too much power. So this is the installation. We had a bit everywhere, but most of the base stations were really uh, at the arrival in our room, the GSM room, because we needed to debug it, and in the hack center. And in all of the conference rooms. So this is what we had. We had seven GSM base stations, five UMTS base stations, and they were really running with low power. With GSM, we could go up to two watts, but the issue is that we have too many people, and um, our base station can't, can't handle the load. For every base station, for GSM base station, for example, you can only have three calls at the same time. So if we have more subscribers, nobody would be able to call. It was already quite hard to, to, to do some calls. A bit of numbers. So we sold this year 2,500 cards. Thanks to the POC for taking care of selling the cards. This is a huge task. Um, although we sold that many cards and you could reuse the cards from past year, only 900 of them registered a token or registered an extension at the POC. Everyone else could use the GSM network because you still get an extension and you still can send SMSs and calls, uh, send SMSs within the network, but not to decked and outside. For the SMSs, actually, we had quite a lot because we have spammers, but it doesn't require a lot of bandwidth, so we don't really care. We even let the spammer through. It's not really important. We don't know how many subscribers were there in total or how many calls. We didn't do any statistics because we spent a lot of time on setting up the network. For over the year, one of the pain points of GSM and UMTS is the licenses. You need some kind of license to operate the networks, and they are all sold to the big operators. So while in the past years we could have a test license for the Bundesnetzagentur, this doesn't exist anymore because all the frequencies were sold. So for GSM, Telecom provided us with three channels. Thanks, Telecom. <laughs> uh, 
And for UMTS, there's quite a, there's a bit of trick because we have US base stations and the US band is not used in Europe. So we just could apply for a UMTS bandwidth that the Buddhist NetSec into it could edit, get it. This is also why some UMTS phones were not able to join our network simply because this is a kind of weird band which is not the standard European band. But for all newer smartphones, they support this band. It works. The GSM and UMTS network works. It took a lot of, lot of time to, to start it because we had to install the whole infrastructure and it was starting with day two. Um, was really starting to work. GSM had no data, but UMTS had no voice. So you really had to switch all the time in your phone. Do I want to be reachable with voice? Do I want to have some data? Because sometimes the Wi-Fi doesn't work. It's, it's up to you. <laughs> and there were a lot of crashes, but that's also the purpose of trying to operate it here is for us to scale up the whole network because when we ever when we use the Osmocom network or all the software, we only have one base station and one phone connected to it. So it's quite rare to have crashes. And when we have crashes, we just use another phone because we don't want to see why. And here we have no choice. We have lots of data, lots of base stations, lots of phones. So we traced all the we have quorums for all the crashes and we will submit it already some tickets and we will submit a lot more tickets. So thanks for pen testing our network. <laughs> Now we know how it works, so next year it will probably be a lot faster to set up. The configurations are there, we will never touch them again, except changing the IPs. <laughs> um, we will fix some things, so UMTS is quite new, there was no voice for UMTS, this will be added. There will be a lot more UMTS base stations simply because they are smaller, so, and we have, we have no, a number of them, so we can spread even more of them a bit everywhere. And maybe we can have LTE because with LTE the advantage is that the hardware is readily available so we can get it. We just lack the software. So if anyone wants to play with LTE, it's a lot simpler than what I showed with UMTS and GSM. Feel free to, to join us and, and have a talk and then we can maybe tell, integrate LTE with GSM and UMTS and have an awesome mobile network at the next Congress. And that's it. So if there are any questions, yeah, I'm happy to answer them. Are there questions? Yes, there, number seven, please, shoot. Um, between the congresses, how do you test the uh, hardware and software? Because you said you need a license from the Bundesnetzagentur. Mm -hmm. So um, we... There are, you don't always need a license for the Bundesnetzagentur, for example. This is only if you want to operate on licenses which are or frequency which are already used. If you want to operate on frequencies which are readily available, like Bind5 for UMTS, you can already get licenses. And this is only if you want to provide it over the air. If you just use cables, connect your base stations to your phone using a cable, you don't require any license. You can also put both things in a Faraday cage and this way you don't, uh, you don't interfere with the other networks. Or sometimes you just forget and you have a very, very small power and it's, it still works. So these are, these are the way to do it. <laughs> Great. Is there another question here? Well, what a test lab it is, isn't it? GSM network. It's, well, it's, it's worrying. <laughs> Thank you very much, really. A last applause before we go over to the next topic. Thank you very much, Leon. Looking forward to the future. Okay, then it's time for the VOC review. Stage is yours. Audience is waiting. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. So, um... You may have noticed these guys in the, in the audience with the red telly lights. And they and a lot of other people bring you video from the Video Operations Center and I might have some details about that. So, um, as you may be aware, we try to stream our stuff. Now there has been uh, a lot of technology in the recent years, a lot of technology development 
um, as to how about modern streaming. Um, and we tried to adapt for that. So um, this year, we had a completely new transcoding setup, which allowed to uh, basically have uh, one Matroshka uh, internal um, sort of you know format where we have um, the slides, uh, the video format, the uh, the three languages. Uh, so we had three languages in most talks, which was awesome, um, and we had a completely new way of. Um, playing out the signal in different ways in HLS. This time, um, the first year around, uh, with also with Dash. And we even could make this the default for day two. So during operations, I hope there, was no, uh, there were no big problems with that. Um, but we had adaptive playing. So when you um, had low bandwidth, it would automatically degrade to slide only and audio, then to um, SD, and finally, and I hope you could all enjoy this, thanks to the NOC, uh, full HD. Um, um, yeah, as I said, to translation. And additionally, for everyone here in the rooms, we provided low latency ice cast um, streams, so you could hear uh, the translations on site. Um, and finally, I think for the first time around, we had community feeds, and we love them. Like the Fryphone community um, had their uh, broadcasted through our infrastructure. Um, we had uh, an OB uh, unit at uh, our assembly, um, which broadcast uh, through our uh, network. And finally, we had C3 TV. Uh, which you, I, I hope you took an opportunity watching. We tried to replay all, a lot of, you know, old Congress content. Um, hint, it's coming to Media CCC soon. We got, you know, a bag of tapes that were suddenly dropped, and as way back as I think 93. Let's see. Eventually, it may emerge on Media CCC DE. And this was a great uh, sneak peek at this point. Um, yeah, we hinted to that last year. Uh, we said we might do 4K because why not? Um, so we did. Um, as a very experimental setup this time, um, we used the hardware mixer there, um, but we learned a lot of stuff concerning the delivery and the, speci uh, the uh, specialties of 4K streaming. Let's see what next year brings. Uh, we got a bit of fancy new hardware because Without hardware, we are geeks. It's, it's fairly boring. Uh, so we rolled out our own layer one network on site uh, and had NOC transport us um, to you know, the external locations. Um, we had a layer two to the data center to Berlin, um, thanks to the NOC. Um, and this will allow us to tear down most of the stuff here and have the last talk transcode in the data center. So hopefully the talks that are in the end of uh, today um, will be available to you much sooner than in the recent years. Um, and finally, next to the 4K streams, we had Voctomix in all rooms, so our own software-defined mixer, and we also uh, took the opportunity this year, not just this event, but over the year, to open source all of our components uh, that are required to set up the stuff yourself, including Ansible recipes. So go, do your own stuff, use the stuff at, the assemb at your assemblies. We want to take on a lot of your assembly streams next year. If you want to do this, come find us, talk to us. We are happy to broadcast your stuff. Great. Thank you for your fantastic work. You're welcome. Um, we took uh, uh, we took a bit of <laughs> we took a bit of um, 
um, well, experiments around Voctomix. So this year we had uh, uh, camera controls uh, that, that used you know, the current state of the mixer um, so these guys can actually see what's going on and if they're alive or not. And we had real professional intercoms that were provided to us, and this, was, this, this really made it a lot easier to coordinate between uh, camera, uh, the guys in the backstage that do all the mixing, um, so um, this was, and of course, our room uh, in, the con uh, in the Congress Center. Uh, and for the first time, we had an audio control room, audio regie. So what does that mean? I mean, what we do is not only video, but audio. So for the first time, we have released all talks in stereo. So, give us reasons, give us reasons, please. Because when we, when, when we did the slides, I was actually, um, and s someone said, no, don't, don't mention anything about this. And I was like, okay, why not? I mean, there's a lot of master people in the, in the audience. They definitely have ideas. Please come find us for why you read five, uh, need 5.1. Pardon? So, um, the other cool thing is this audio control room uh, remotely controlled the hardware mixers in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the halls. And so we had an independent mix that was independent from the PA here. And this is really, really uh, a huge step forward in terms of stream and uh, audio quality because, you know, there are simply different things um, you need for, you know, um, making sure the sound is good in this huge hall and making sure the audio is good in a stream. So we could do that. And we um, had real good loudness meters and we tried to hit a target of minus uh, 16 uh, decibel loudness units full scale. And this is actually derived from the European Broadcasting Union's R128 standard. And we had backup audio over Dante Network. Dante is an audio standard, uh, also, which is also IP-based. Of course, we had casualties. I mean, encoding and streaming uh, video is no easy business. Um, one transcoder died in the process. Uh, we, uh, we, we just sent the remainings to Intel. Um, we had one encoder throttling the CPU because we put up too much technology on these uh, encoder cubes that we had. And we noticed that when our monitoring screamed at us that a load of, you know, 40-something might not be healthy. Uh, we had some broken audio embedders, but we still have enough backup chains to, uh, to rectify the situations. And we had one uh, hanging uh, virtualization host in the data center, but we could recover that as well. So, um, finally to the part that you like. Um, and I want you to take guesses on each day. Um, what do you think was the highest viewed talk on day one? So... Keynote and PC Wahlheck. Second day was the Jahresrückblick. Methodisch incorrect on day three. And this is the total amount, almost uh, 7,000 viewers. And the PC Wahlheck talk had two distinctive peaks. We have no idea what was going on there. Yeah, and what else? I mean, that was really interesting advertisement that popped up during the Snowden talk. <laughs> and I tell you, this was totally unplanned for. So, um, and people say, you know, you guys, you do this um, all the time and you bring your own, you, you create your own hardware. Um, and are you really doing this professionally? We tell you, yes, 
We are professionals. And finally, a big hand to our sponsors and to TechSec, who was the guy that did all the planning and couldn't be here today. And he did, really did fantastic work. And to everyone who made this possible. Thank you so much. Questions? Are there questions here? Yes, there, from the web. Start with it. The 3043 Everywhere community would like to thank you very much for making it able to participate in the Congress experience. And they would like to know more about the hardware and software and the vendors that you use for transcoding. Um, so in general, we use different, so, so we use donated hardware. Uh, we use um, specific, you know, these, uh, these small uh, Nook machines that really come in handy because they are really compact and uh, you can easily bring them to events. Uh, we also have some, it's, it's, it's usually just standard hardware because everything we build, we build to work um, essentially uh, on, on all platforms. So we are quite flexible there. Um, and, well, most of this... Uh, most of the uh, um, st stuff that actually encodes is FFmpeg. Um, yeah. All right. Another question? Still from the web? Yes. The question is about the slide stream. Yes. Is that a bug or is it intentional that it is such low quality this year? Um, it is, uh, it is in, in a way, um, on purpose, because it's also a way to um, to allow people uh, with you know less uh, with degraded network connectivity um, to actually participate. That said, we are trying um, to make sure that the slides have a have a certain amount of quality, um, and and that's of course a trade-off. But um, if you have specific you know comments, um, find us on IRC so we can talk this through. Okay, thank you. Is there another question? Thank you very much for uh, this whole overview. We still have the part of the assembly to do. Huh? Uh, first, if, please, to the audience, if you want to leave to the Adam, please leave that side. And the other ones, try to leave that way because it will be crowded after this lecture. Um, another message here, there is a call. You know, we have a teardown waiting for us still to go. You know, this is not the last, last bit, but we have to help, so there's a call for angels to do and help in this teardown to make sure that this all ends successfully. Good. Yes, an applause for each other, come on. <laughs> Assembly. Im Deutsch. Again, uh, actually it's not working here. Oh, no problem. There okay, here we go. Oh, <laughs> hot batching the alpha. All right. Um, ja, hallo erstmal. Um, also vom Assembly Team hatten wir uh, genannt hot patching the alpha, weil das einfach die Alpha Version ist. Irgendjemand hatte gemeint, das ist kein Problem, das auf Deutsch zu halten. Jetzt habe ich gesehen, die meisten waren auf Englisch. Ich bleibe jetzt aber mal bei Deutsch. Ähm, wir haben von dieser Halle angefangen und in sehr vielen Iterationen über sehr viel kurze Zeit äh, mit viel hin und her diese Version gebaut, die dann auch äh, final gebaut worden ist. Da gab es einige nächtliche Planungssessions. Wir mussten uns dann in Kürze noch wenige Wochen vorm Kongress noch mal ein paar Wege umbauen und ähnliches, um aller Anforderungen gerecht zu werden. Ich hoffe, dass das zumindest so einigermaßen gepasst hat für die meisten. Wie gesagt, das ist eine Alpha. Das nächste Problem... <lacht> Danke. Danke. Eine der interessanten Sachen war die Geschichte mit der Anmeldung. Ich persönlich hätte das gerne sehr viel früher gehabt. 
Wir hatten mehrfach den Techniker informiert, um die Wiki-Anmeldung freizuschalten. Final ging sie dann am 1.11. los. Wir haben sie offiziell bis 15.11. offen gelassen. Dem Dump, mit dem wir dann gearbeitet haben, um die Assemblies zu platzieren, haben wir dann noch mal 14 Tage später gezogen. Also so diese üblichen Deadline-Verpeiler. Wir haben mit der schönen Zahl 256 angemeldeten Assemblies gearbeitet. Ähm, nach der erweiterten Deadline haben sich natürlich noch mal weitere Verpeiler angemeldet. Und der offizielle Rekordhalter wollte am 26.12. um 14.42 Uhr gerne noch mal so ein paar Tische haben. Die Statistiken gibt es bei uns heute mit ohne Grafiken. Wir hatten so circa 3000 verfügbare Sitzplätze geplant. Ähm, Dreieinhalbtausend Anmeldungen hatten wir über das Wiki. Also wir mussten da leider einen kleinen Schäuble polen und mal überall die Kürzungsliste ansetzen. Wir haben ungefähr 15 Prozent mehr Fläche für die Assemblies gehabt gegenüber äh, Hamburg und circa 20 Prozent mehr Anmeldungen. Aufgrund der Alpha-Planung und so ein paar umgebauten äh, Wegen in der Halle, die eigentlich mal anders geplant waren, ist uns leider doch ein bisschen mehr Platz verloren gegangen. Im Nachhinein aber nicht so ganz wirklich schlimm, weil das Stuhllager ist das. Alles leer. Wir haben alles auf der Fläche. Also wirklich nur noch, wer seht hinten, drei einzelne verlorene Tische, die ich so als Notfall irgendwo mal in der Ecke gepackt habe. Wobei das auch nicht so ganz stimmt. Die äh, Messe war so freundlich und hat uns eine Mobiliarliste geschickt und nicht so ganz das geliefert, was da drauf stand. Und unter anderem musste ich dann an äh, Tag zwei mal noch ein paar Leuten ihr geheimes Stuhllager zeigen, äh, Tischlager zeigen. Unten im CCL ganz versteckt. Selbst die Messe wusste nicht, dass da noch Tische stehen. <lacht> Wir werden das jetzt inventarisieren. <lacht> Was wir dieses Jahr eingeführt hatten, waren die, da gab es ein kleines Naming-Problem, ich nenne das jetzt mal Center Cluster Orbits. Ich glaube, die meisten wissen, was damit gemeint war. Ähm, wir haben davon ein paar größere gehabt, im Vorfeld sehr früh mal gefragt, im Juli. Es kam relativ spät erst Antwort ähm, oder Feedback von den meisten. Ähm, Art and Play habt ihr vielleicht gesehen, direkt wenn man reinkommt, links, sehr schöne Geschichten passiert. Chaos West mit einer sehr großen Bühne. Kommuna mit einigen ähm, Workshop-Räumen und einer sehr offenen Struktur, Open Infrastructure Orbit mit viel Freifunk, viel Internet, ähm, einer kleinen Bühne und Workshop-Fläche. Rights and Freedom äh, Center ist leider ein bisschen untergegangen im CCL äh, in Saal 3. Vielleicht kann man da noch mal ganz kurz vorbeischauen, Hallo sagen. Ähm, und dann eine Großbarben-Installation der Hive äh, durch die Seabase initialisiert, auch mit einigen Bühnen- und Workshop-Räumen. War dieses Jahr noch ein bisschen holprig, aber hey, ist die Alpha. Ähm, ein ganz, ganz, ganz dickes Lob muss ich an das C3NAV-Team loswerden. Applaus Schlicht und ergreifend, weil die uns an Tag 0 und Tag 1 ähm, <lacht> gerettet haben weil die ganze Zeit die Anfragen auf uns eingeprasselt sind, hey, wo ist unsere Assembly? Und wir konnten sagen, suchen C3 NAV, danke. Ähm, wir hoffen, dass das nächstes Jahr ein bisschen runterlaufen wird. Das ist so eins auf unserer Liste. Ähm, ein ganz dickes Lob auch an die Center, die uns sehr viel Arbeit auch abgenommen haben, sich super toll selbst organisiert haben. Liebend gerne aufgerufen, build more centers. Für nächstes Jahr tut was, überlegt euch was, ihr habt gesehen, was hier geht. Wir haben ein bisschen mehr Fläche hoffentlich mal nächstes Jahr. Irgendwo müssen wir mal noch Möbel auftreiben, aber auch das kriegen wir hin. Ein ganz dickes Lob auch nochmal an die einzelnen Assemblies. Ihr wart super lieb zu uns, ähm, auch wenn ihr euch im Schäuble-Stil doch einiges wegstreichen mussten. Immer mal wieder. Ähm, es hat aber sehr gut funktioniert. Dem Assemblies-Team selber natürlich, mit dem ich ganz viel beschäftigt war und allen Aufbauhelfern und Engeln. Vielen, vielen Dank.
Great. Thank you very much for this uh, overview. Thank you. We also um, uh, possible in English if somebody has some. Is there anyone with any question? And no, there are no more chairs left. Sorry. Oh, on the web. <laughs> yes. Are statistics and maybe pictures available from the kids area? Um, that was not my department. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, the uh, kids space was um, some kind of a center and uh, self-organized. I can ask the guy if he uh, can make something available, but I don't know yet. I need to ask him. Is someone willing to pay for it or for the pictures? No? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you everybody uh, for this massive event. Great, okay, over to the next step. And that's about translation. Subtitles. Right, which is just taking what is spoken and, and turning it into words that are displayed on screen. It's not translating, it's just taking the original language and putting that into words. So, right, uh, you might have noticed that this year we didn't have any live subtitles because we just didn't have the time to organize that and so we focused on, on what we think is a bit more important and that is having subtitle releases for the talk. And, well, so this graph shows the number of seconds um, of talks in blue and then various stages of subtitles that have been developed during this Congress. So in green are completed subtitles and then we have the yellow ones which are at some stage of quality control. We have the orange ones that are subtitles currently being timed. So we already have a complete transcript of the talk but we are still adjusting the timing of when to display which subtitle. And then we also have the red subtitles, that is transcripts being written or being corrected. So we're starting from, from transcripts generated from machine audio recognition techniques and um, well, those are usually missing punctuation and also contain mistakes, so people have to go through that and basically check that everything matches what is being said. In numbers, we have had over 100 angels working on subtitles throughout this Congress for a total of 336 hours, producing um, at the point when we wrote the slides 79 hours of material. So that's about 4.2 hours of work for every hour of material that gets released, which is about the, the speed difference between spoken word and written text. Um, so, earlier today when we wrote the slide, we had 16 subtitles released for this Congress. Um, it should be about 20 right now, um, and it's still going on, so more to come. And because there weren't any recordings available for most of day one, we just took subtitles, uh, so talks from, from last year and started to subtitle those. So that also got us 10 subtitles for earlier talks. And then we, we have um, about 64 hours of, other, of, of material in various stages of, of being uh, processed. So we have 30 hours transcribed talks, 22 hours being timed, and 12 hours being checked, which probably is also already changed because people are still working on that. And well, so one of the benefits of, of having finished subtitles is that you can do funny stuff. So for example, you get statistics for the speed at which people talk and what words they use the most. This is one talk from, from last year, I'm not quite sure which one. Um, so it's about people and bias and language and examples. I'm not quite sure, yeah. And well, so there's about 800 strokes per minute, which is not one of the fastest talks we had but it's still a lot faster than what most people type. And if you want to help make Congress accessible for everyone, then Tuvat and, well, you can also start writing subtitles with us. Um, it's something you can do the whole year, not just during Congress. Just go to our website and you'll find instructions on how to do that. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. You can come to our IRC chat room I can also follow the, the SRT releases account to just 
see when new subtitles get released. Thank you. Are there... <laughs> right. Great, thank you. Yes. So, are there any questions? Is there a question? <laughs> Okay. None. Well, <laughs> none on the internet. Okay. <laughs> ah, something. Oh, there is someone. one. Yes. Here, microphone two. Uh, where can you find the subtitles? Right. So the the subtitles are on on some link. Um, it's well, mirrors dot or mirror dot safnet dot de, and then That's somewhere um, CCC and Congress. And 34C3, and then, well, oh. no, not there. Sorry? Up, up, up. You're pointing up. <coughs> hmm? Yes. Oh. oh. Ah, right, yeah, no. Ah, yes. Yes, under, under C3 subtitles, and then, yes. You have 34, C3, so those are currently all the subtitles available. Great. Someone else a question? So, someone on the web, maybe? No, not for <laughs> now. Okay, then we have to... Uh, get to the next thing, the assemblies. Isn't okay, that true? Right. Yes. Yes, okay. thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> give him an applause as loud as you can, please. <laughs> Whoa, you. <laughs> Great, thanks man. Right.